Good afternoon, April 19, 2023, uh, Commission, on a uh, Commission on Aging. Um, happy to see you all here. Uh, call the meeting to order. Um, first, the agenda. Um, I gather it is um, written as approved. Does anyone might want to make any changes or additions to the agenda? That's a no. Um, Correct. I can, yep. Okay. I can see, um, I can only see one table within um, the room. Oh, so. great. So Amy, I have, um, for the most part there, uh, Jared just popped it over. So for the most part, the three of us are sitting here and then um, Steve and Mary, just Mary just walked in, um, are sitting together. So there you go. Jared's okay. popping the video around a little bit. So. Perfect. That's who's in the room today. All right, thank you. And I see that uh, um, Kathy just uh, popped in on Zoom also. So good to see you all. All right, so um, do we have a motion to approve the agenda as written? I so move. All right, do we have a second? I, I have Danielle as the first. I'll take Kathy as a second. Very good, thank you. All in favor? I guess we have no opposed. We'll take it that way instead. <laughs> I'm usually chairing meetings in person, so sorry guys. Um, next is our consent items. And we only have one item on our consent agenda, which is approval of the March 15 minutes. Um, does anyone want to make any changes uh, to the minutes from March 15? We have a motion to approve the minutes as written. This is Danielle, I'll so move. And a second, do we need a second? Yeah, we have a second. I'll second it. Okay. <laughs> All in, anyone opposed, uh, raise your hand on Zoom or um, let us know in person. All right. I would say that our consent item is approved. Um, we are now up for public comment. Uh, do we have any public in the room, Michelle? So, so Amy, I'm going to jump in and make a public comment. Uh, we did have the City Fountain Council member, Dr. Dietra Duncan, who was going to speak as well. Um, again, she may come on or I may just share in a little bit what uh, she had brought up. Um, but I'll go ahead and um, mention something. And then Penny Whitney's on. Penny might want to give an update after I'm done as well. Um, so I just wanted to uh, mention to everyone, for people who are not maybe aware, that uh, this week is Volunteer Appreciation Day on, I think, the 20th. And in honor of the folks who have been on the Commission on Aging, we are uh, thanking all of you guys. Um, who are on the Commission on Aging for serving as well as kind of volunteering. It's kind of an interesting line there. But I have um, some little things to hand out today for people in the room. And so we have a $10 gift card wow. for those... For those who are in Colorado Springs, it's to the Caffeinated Cow, which is over off of 8th Street, mm -hmm. and they sell ice cream and coffee. Um, for those who live in uh, Park County... Uh, Amy, you're getting a, you have a $10 little gift waiting at the granite, uh, dog on it. What's it called up there in Lake George? The little, um, the little, uh, country store up there in Lake George. You have a little yeah, $10. Granite, granite Canyon store. Thank you. Thank you. There Craig you is go. An awesome yep. gentlemen. Thank you. Yep. So that's waiting for you. And then for Steve, you have a little gift card from Cafe Leo. Oh. So, so thank you, you guys. Um, the volunteering thing is, you know, kind of a neat opportunity to say thanks for people spending extra time. And I know the folks on the Commission on Aging have especially spent a lot of extra time over the last year and a half and really appreciate it. Um, and so, again, as you guys leave today, or actually I'll just kind of hand these around the room a little bit. Um, for people to enjoy at the little caffeinated cow and the other places. So in your neighborhood, um, you are welcome, you guys. And um, 
And then the next thing that I'll mention is just a little bit of a heads up on what Dr. Deidre Duncan had brought to the executive committee's attention um, kind of earlier in the month. So she came to talk to the executive committee about the fact that the city of Fountain does not have a long-term care community. And she is a councilwoman from Fountain. And so she did want to just kind of bring that to our attention and see if that was something that the Commission on Aging might want to look into. And um, and so we can actually spend a little bit of time talking about that later on in the agenda. Uh, and possibly she'll come on, uh, but I have a suspicion that she won't. Um, but our agency, the AAA, is actually also working with her as well um, to continue that conversation along with our ombudsman. But um, so, and I can talk more about that later on in the agenda. And so with that, um, uh, Penny, do you want to give an update on anything since you're here with us? Of course, Melissa, I always want to do updates. And uh, we had a very um, solid March, so I will go back a bit to March and then follow up with April. Uh, beginning with March, on March 2nd, JAWS, uh, Jumpstart Aging Workforce Solutions, which is an El Paso County ARPA grant awarded to UCCS and my firm, Apani Partners, is a subrecipient to UCCS. We had our first long-term care, a community conversation event at UCCS, being the first event that we have done because the goal and the mission of JAWS is to develop a community pilot model to recruit and retain long-term care workforce. And basically the urgency for our committee, our community was sourced in 2021 when across the state during COVID at that time, seven nursing homes had closed and four of those were in El Paso County. So that was sort of the red flag wake up call. But the energy that actually resulted from that day is remarkable and we're going to be continuing. Um, we had over 140 people registered and attended. We were nervous. We had no idea how many we would actually get. We had over 25 table partners that were long-term care leaders, um, stakeholders in long-term care, community um, providers, for example, like Silver Key and the um, Salvation Army. But probably one of the most powerful takeaways from that day was that our keynote speaker, a young man, um, late 20s probably, from New York City that switched from a program in film to become a CNA because he was so astonished by the care that his grandmother was receiving that he now, um, he was a CNA, uh, and now he is becoming an, an administrator in training. But anyway, Jonas spoke to the student population there. And as a result of that particular day, UCCS now is going to be able to fund and have active summer internships for at least eight, hopefully more, <clears throat> interns that said, yes, I'd never considered long-term care, but after today, I am interested in doing an internship. And one of the really exciting parts about this is that there was a strong clinical representation, of course, from the School of Nursing at UCCS. But one of the local long-term care nursing home administrators said, in all my years, I have never had a student say, I want to learn more about the work you do and do what you do. So the energy for all of the areas that our career opportunities and long term care seem to be sparked that day. The other unsuspected um, outcome of this is that we also have pre med students that are very interested in shadowing and learning more about the physician's role in long term care. That was really on a wish list. We did not anticipate um, having enthusiastic 
request for how do we get involved in this? The other outcome, and we'll be following up with this tomorrow, we have a very strong partnership with our JAWS local program with the Colorado Community College System. Jordan Whittington, the young man who oversees the career and technical uh, education component, early on told us that there are 13 career and technical education programs in El Paso County. We will meet with a group of long-term care leaders tomorrow to map out a 15-hour curriculum. Jordan is very optimistic that we will get several demonstration pilots of this engagement of high school students directly with long-term care communities um, before the end of the summer. And hopefully we will be offering this as a regular component of the CTE um, experience-based workforce learning. So that is very exciting. Uh, more to come, JAWS is now going into its second year, <clears throat> excuse me, and we are going to be working with the commission, with PPACG um, on becoming, strengthening that partnership for a sustainability plan, because we really feel that what's happening in El Paso County is something that we can showcase to the state that long-term care is not a place, it's a community. Then on April 4th, um, I'm also the co-chair of the Colorado Direct Care Workforce Collaborative. Because of the Colorado Commission on Aging, the support and the active engagement of Representative Young and Senator Janal, we were able to have a tribute to direct care workers on the floor of each of our legislative houses and the proclamation of the governor declaring April 2nd through the 8th as a direct care worker um, designated week was again a success beyond anticipation. So the, the collaborative has taken the energy and you will hear more about this. We will use the energy behind that event and push it down to local constituencies to build legislative relationships so that the Acknowledgement Week will become a regular um, yearly event and this will become an important part of increasing the community awareness of the importance of long-term care, but particularly the role across the continuum of the direct care worker. So in the last two months in Colorado, El Paso County, we have had some very important steps forward. So um, continuing to the future. Any Penny, questions? Thank you. Yeah. Penny, thank you very much for a great update. And um, You're amazing, fantastic outreach and work. Um, you know, there's nothing better than reaching uh, uh, kids in high school um, and early on in college where they still have their grandparents around and they still have a heart for us older people and can understand the value that they can derive to anyone at that age group in their career choice. So um, that yes. fires me up and that's very exciting. Good. Well, and I spoke with Jordan today, preparing for tomorrow's work session. Um, I told him, and this is an, an outcome of the briefing on the uh, earlier last week for the PPACG, we had areas of particularly rural Calhan tellers saying, help us understand how we can build awareness for long-term care. And it sounds like Fountain is another target area. So those are going to be uh, destinations for outreach for JAWS because we really want it to be a regional program. It's not a limited um, concern. And you're right, Amy, the opportunity for solid careers, we know that the long-term care world, it's not all about older people, but the majority of people that are served are older. And the reality is most of us in our aging process will need some sort of support from the long-term care community. So if we can get 
an excited awareness that there are job opportunities, and this is a good place to be, I think, that will be ahead of the game. So we'll keep posted, but um, I definitely have got you on the radar as one of our project partners for JAWS. All right, thank you very much. And I see that, um, Kathy, you uh, have your hand up to make a comment. Yes, I just wanted to kind of add on to that. The State Commission uh, Policy Committee yesterday. Uh, committee yesterday. Sorry, my thing's uh, echoing. Sorry, my thing's echoing. But um, they voted to uh, support a uh, fund increase for Medicaid. Um, long-term care so i don't know how that's going to play out and how the budget works and all that stuff but i thought it was good that they at least had it on their radar penny you're on mute sorry about that absolutely kathy kathy and i think that what we're seeing is the number of people that are expressing an interest and being at the table because the reimbursement is a big part and the fact that that's even something that's on the table for discussion right now uh, is wonderful. So having you and the policy committee, Kathy, continue to track that is very important. And Penny, remind me what date uh, the event happened at UCCS? March 2nd. It Thank you. Was uh, long-term JAWS, Jumpstart Aging Workforce Solutions, long-term care, a community conversation. And it literally was a community conversation. We had students, we had K through 12 represented, we had community partners, and um, probably one of the most heartwarming was uh, Mount Carmel uh, Veterans Group. And they said, you know, we've got a gentleman that is a veteran that's 86 years old. Do we have opportunity for him to do volunteer work? He said he absolutely refuses to sit on his couch watching TV and just wait for his transition. So that's going to be one of the things that we're really looking for. That long-term care is not age specific. It embraces us all. So that's it's it's exciting. All right, thank you. Very exciting. Does anyone else have a comment or a question for Penny? All right, thank you very much. Um, you are welcome to stay for the rest of our meeting or if you have other items to get take care of this afternoon, you may bow out. Mm -hmm. I won't be able to stay a bit longer because I'm very interested, but I will not be able to stay for the duration. But thanks for this time. Bet. Thank you. All right. Um, our next item on the agenda is action items. And I must confess that I um, zoomed in only for a short portion of our uh, executive board meeting two weeks ago because I was working a fire in Park County. <laughs> So, Melissa, I'm going to lean on you for this one. We don't have any action items, so we're good. Sure. Okay, great. Yep. Thank you. Um, information okay. items. Um, I do not see Paula is here for membership committee. Do you have anything, Melissa? I am. I'm here. Oh, I'm are here. you? I found it. I found the link. <laughs> I, I've been, my, my laptop wouldn't let me get in Teams, so I'm on my phone and I am here. And the as far as membership, uh, again, uh, Melissa helped me remember because my my brain is scattered in a million directions right now. So can you help me remember where we're at with our membership? So we had Suzanne Baker, who was out of town. Right. We had another one that I think, Mary, you referred to us. And why am I drawing a blank? Okay, so Leela Gibson is out there. And then um, uh, Jamie Brown with yes. the Colorado uh, yeah. Springs Health Foundation. I have a report from Jamie and she welcomed the invitation. She at this time is not able to 
add something more to her schedule, but would love to be included on any committee work or know of the committee work we're doing. And um, when the opportunity arises um, for her to join us, she would like to let us know that and um, and actually get involved with us. She just right now she just can't handle anything else and she did not want to join and not be able to do it 100%. So Jamie's very interested. She's interested in our work and she would love to take part in events or any committee work that we have um, if she's able and just as long as we keep her in the loop. So that was that was an excellent connect. Um, and I believe Dayton set that up. So we had great we had a couple zooms with her and and she is really glad for our work and is interested in in staying in the loop so all right and we'll have to follow up with Layla yes and then I have had um Carolyn Wilson from Pace reach out and contact me um right. and so I'm not you know so that's a possibility and we'll discuss that at the executive committee the next time we meet um, she also may be interested in the mobility coordinating committee because PACE does a lot of transporting, but maybe she would do both, or maybe there would be another PACE representative that would do the mobility coordinating committee. So we have a couple of interesting options there with uh, PACE uh, possibly great. getting involved. So stay tuned that, for that. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Anybody have any questions or any information to provide to Paula regarding membership. Okay, Paula, thank you. And it's good to see you. I see your your little circle with a P in it on the, the <laughs> call here. <laughs> oh, Pen Penny's got the same circle. I'll show my face in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, next item on the agenda is Policy Committee, Colorado Center for Aging. Um, and I have, I'm just gonna provide a real quick update since I do, um, participate in those meetings. They've got several bills that are still working through the process that are on their priority list. And I'll just go through them real quick. Uh, SB 23-031 is to improve healthcare access for older Coloradans. And that bill is uh, unamended and two appropriations. So it is moving through the process. Uh, SB 058 is job application fairness, and that is to eliminate items that could alert a em potential employer to the age of the applicant so they cannot be age discriminated against. And that has been referred unamended to um, the House Committee of the Whole, so it's already made it through the Senate. So it looks like that one is probably going to make it through to the governor's desk. Um, SB 064 is Office of Public Guardianship, and it looks like um, that one is um, referred, it's been amended, and it's referred to appropriations within the Senate, so it's still got to make it through the House. Um, SB 144, Prescription Drugs for Chronic Pain, and I know they've tried to do this one a couple times. Oh, I'm so sorry, that's my call. Um, that they have been trying to get this one through for a couple of years, and it is at um, it's in, been concurred and um, as amended um, through the House to the House and Senate. So it looks like it is going to be going through um, for um, final floor work of the uh, House of the Whole. And last one, SB two one three, which is the land use bill. And they're tracking that one based on improving uh -oh. affordable housing. And that one has been amended to appropriations within the Senate. So um, those are the ones they're tracking just to, to let you know they've got an eye on a couple food accessibility bills and um, one to modify property tax deferred programs. And that one's HB 1284. Um, they're just trying to make it easier for if a senior needs to defer their property tax um, due to you know, financial challenges, they can defer it and then the property tax is covered when the home is sold. Um, so 
uh, that's a good program if somebody gets to the point where they need to take advantage of that. Uh, anybody have any questions or any comments? Uh, Amy, can you explain the first one, the access to health care for older adults? Can you explain that one yes. to us a bit? Absolutely. Let me give you the a quick summary. Um, it says that uh, uh, it's fully funded and already is scheduled. Um, it is to um, uh, our advocate Jody Waterhouse is working through it. And let me pull up the the bill. I've got it on my other computer. So hold on. Let me get to that page real quick. While you're pulling that up, Amy, I am kind of curious about the difference between what Kathy mentioned earlier about the State Commission on Aging supporting a bill to increase Medicaid reimbursement um, and where that's falling. Um, I feel like I heard about that once a long time ago, but then I thought that we'd kind of already done that at one point in time. But um, so maybe in a few seconds we could talk about that as well. Sure. Um, the um, to give a quick recap of the um, of SB 031, it creates a multiple disciplinary healthcare provider access training program to improve healthcare of medically complex, costly, compromised, and vulnerable Coloradans. And the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Center will develop, implement, and administer the program. And so it may be offered to Colorado institutions of higher education with clinical health professions, graduate degree programs. So it is a way to try to help increase uh, medical um, training and uh, additional uh, students within the uh, healthcare arena um, and, and focusing on ger geriatric training opportunities for clinical health professionals and graduate students. And um, you can easily go to leg.colorado.gov and then do a search under bills um, if you want to read the whole bill or read a more in-depth um, summary of the bill. Thank you. And sure, my pleasure. And I'm trying to figure out which one is. I can try to do a search for it if you would like me to. Uh, that's okay. We can circle back to it at a later date, even still. Um, uh, but Kathy, do I'm you just... know what bill number it is? Yeah, I think Kathy's frozen. I think she is too. And oh, warning, yeah. my internet can you hear me? kind of. Yes. It's HB23 is the reimbursement. Say that one more time, Kathy. HB23 is what I wrote down. Okay. And then we need another kind of add on to that. Is it, you know, 15, 17, or we need the second part of that? Oh. Because this indicates okay. it's House Bill 2023. So it's this year's um, bill. Yeah. But that's oh, good. That's I'm kind of intrigued by this because again um, I thought we I did already uh, agree to pay folks who were providing services under Medicaid but it might have been only for behavioral health providers was the first go round, and maybe now this is different but go ahead. Right. yeah and I do not see it but what I can do is I can go through the um, Colorado Center for Aging uh, bill list and if I find it, uh, Melissa, I will email it to you and you can pat, you can forward it on if anyone would like to look at that in depth and possibly testify for it. I'm sure that uh, they would be grateful for the input. Go ahead. 
This is Steve. Uh, yeah, I would definitely be interested in learning more about that and uh, if appropriate, testifying or, or providing whatever input I can. Great. Amy, do you have in, any information on the bill regarding pain coverage? Um, that that one's a very intriguing one. Yes, I will. Let me pull up that summary real quick. Um, it has been a long time coming and it's exciting that it's made it this far. Um, it's SB 23-144. And I think the challenge with that one has been um, they did a lot of a lot of work trying to reduce opioid um, uh, overuse. And in that effort, they actually made it very hard for people with chronic pain who have been on opioids and function very well on opioids because that's their only choice to be able to um, get the amount that they need to be able to sustain their quality of life. So in uh, the summary, it allows a healthcare provider to prescribe, uh, dispense, and or administer a Schedule II, three, four, or five controlled substance to a patient in the course of treatment for a diagnosed condition that causes chronic pain. The bill also clarifies that the prescribing healthcare provider is not subject to disciplinary action by an appropriate regulator for prescribing a dose of a drug that is equal to or more than a morphine milligram equivalent dose. Um, then it says recommendation or threshold as specified in state or federal opioid prescribing guidelines. So it allows a, the doctor to be able to um, treat the patient as they need to be treated without um, pretend, potential um, repercussion for them um, uh, prescribing that amount of drug to their patient. And thank you. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate that. That. Um, any other questions? I see none. Uh, next item on our agenda is um, PPACG Legislative Committee. So, Melissa, do you have a? Uh, do we have an update on that effort? We sure do, Jared, stepping up to the podium. <laughs> oh, so, uh, Thank you, Jared. Commissioner Mitchell, you took all my thunder. You mentioned all the bills I was going to mention. Um, so I'm happy to go into other detail about other bills, not aging related, but uh, you guys got a pretty good update from Commissioner Mitchell. Well, if you want to expound on anything that I said, by all means, you you nailed it. Um, yeah, no, it's, I, it's it's exciting. The uh, I think it was 031. That's that made a lot of movement this week, which is exciting to see that one actually re really start making it through and, and get through the the churn. Um, I'll just add in there. Last day of the, the session is May 8th. So we got about two and a half weeks and then then we're done. Um, and they've got a lot of work left to do. Jared, I think last month you had reported that. Um... Pike Peak Area Agency on Aging has a lobbyist there. Mm -hmm. um, well, the, the council governments, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and then there was specific bills that you guys were supporting. Are there, or did you maintain that support in those previous bills or did you back out in anything? Just an update on that. So all the bills from the last time we talked about, those positions have not changed. Um, as new bills have dropped, we have taken new positions, whether that's monitor, oppose, amend, or support. Um, uh, Commissioner Mitchell mentioned that a lot of activity that we're focused on is the land use bill, SB 23213. Um, and then I know a lot of other um, things are happening uh, on the Senate and the House side. Uh, there are a lot of bills relating to air quality, which is not an aging specific thing, but it is a council of governments thing that we're monitoring, um, as well as regional transportation planning. And I'm just going to add for um, if folks want to attend ever a PPACG board meeting, you know, just to kind of hear some of the conversation that they do have there at the PPACG board level. And 
what's what's important to a lot of the uh, folks that are on the board and elected officials from our jurisdiction is local control. And so that is a conversation that will lead, um, you know, with the land use conversation that happened last week, a lot of it was very much concern for communities um, up the pass, uh, Green Mountain Falls, Woodland Park, uh, you know, just really want to make sure that they are able to retain um, the ability to do what they need to do, what, you know, what's for what's right for their communities. And um, I don't know, Amy, if that particular bill is the same bill that had to do with, you know, your area of, you know, folks that actually owned part of, you know, the collegiate peaks there and, you know, having to have access to a lot of hikers that potentially could hurt themselves. And if that is part of that land use bill, or that's a completely different bill, but, um, you know, when you think about what the PPACG Council of Governments is going to be supporting and where they're going to be standing, they're going to be leaning a lot more towards always wanting to um, be able to retain some type of element of local control within all of the jurisdictions. So um, just know that. And I will also mention the legislative committee meets each Monday at 8.30 in the morning. You got anyone is welcome to just pop in and listen. Mr. Oh. oh, Amy, are you frozen? And if you are, that's OK. <laughs> um, so I will pick up for Amy until she comes back with us. Uh, and Kathy, do you have a comment with your hand up? I just had actually a question. I have a couple of friends in rehab facilities that have multiple sclerosis. And one of them uh, fell off her couch and had a compound fracture. So she's afraid of falling. And she was told she can't have bed rails, that it was a state regulation. And I just had never heard of that before. So I was wondering if anybody had any knowledge about that. And was that at the rehab uh, facility that she was at? Yes. That they yeah. Okay. So and it's in... El Paso, so I don't know if it's a local thing. Yeah. I think that, yeah, people here are shaking heads thinking that that doesn't sound right. She might want to um, call our ombudsman office and, um, you know, kind of do a follow-up check with that. Okay. Yeah, and um, if I may, I would like to really quick comment on SB 213 about um, the land use and how that bill is using it to try to help increase housing. Um, really local control is the issue because we know best at the local level what our deficiencies are, how to promote uh, growth and construction and building in, in our counties. And our water is the issue in Park County. Only development we have is septic and, and well. Uh, we don't have, a, we only have four areas with infrastructure for uh, uh, tap and sewer. And so there's a lot of uh, items that this bill really just doesn't understand about local control and we can serve better. We all want to increase our housing. And so we don't think this is really getting to the crux of the matter, but uh, we will see how it plays out. And the, the um, SB 108, which is the uh, modification of the Colorado Recreational Use Statute uh, mm. that was that died, um, but we are we are at it already for next year to try to help provide protection to private property owners who want to allow outdoor recreation on their property um, and hike the 14ers that go through private property and just protect the landowner because they are very benevolently allowing people to recreate on their land. So uh, we're going to visit that one again next year. So uh, we live to fight another day. But thank you. Thanks, Amy. Uh, so Amy, well, I, I think, oh, sorry. I just Anything else you'd want to say about board items? I was just going to say I did look up the hand hand bed rails as restraints. I have heard that many times. 
in the different facilities I have been in. And, you know, when I started in long-term care back in the 90, early 90s, um, there was not as many regulations on restraints as there were. We actually put the bed on the floor. We had mattresses with lips um, and put the mattress on the floor so that if people fell, it was inches instead of feet. And they, they approved that as, as helping reduce fall risks. We also had beanbag chairs because they were comfortable, yet they couldn't get themselves out of those. They, if they could roll out, that was fine. They were safer to roll than to fall out of a chair. But here I just found that the Joint Commission uh, considers side rails to be a restraint. And if they are doctored ordered, I believe that they are allowed. But even pushing a bed up against the side of a wall and using that side of the wall as a restraint, it's considered a restraint. So um, they are very particular about not restraining residents in long-term care facilities. It's it's considered a restraint and the facility could get um, cited for that. Thank you for that information, Paula. I learned something. Yeah, you're welcome. Melissa, anything else on uh, uh, board items for PPACG? I think we're good. Jared has gone back to his post behind the podium, <laughs> behind, the, behind the screen over there. So and, I think we're good. Yeah, and to that point, uh, relatively light board meeting last week, um, had a great presentation on JAWS, if you guys want to review that. so. All right, our next item E is the chair report, and our chair is off working his job and doing what he needs to be doing today. And um, I got nothing. <laughs> so, Melissa, do you want to fill in? <laughs> I think I'm just going to use this as an opportunity to jump into the data repository, which is something that um, Dayton has worked on. <laughs> so um, item 7A under strategic planning, just kind of taking an opportunity to get in front of you guys this opportunity to look at, you know, when information is going to be presented to us, where do we go to, to find out more um, about the content? And again, I just want to reiterate that we have kind of a working planning calendar. And so things just are happening fast and furious right now at a legislative level that, you know, we are, you know, we're just kind of soaking it all in, but hopefully next year, you know, even starting in, you know, July, we'll actually be a lot more strategic around things that we, uh, uh, subjects and material that we want to kind of get behind. So, you know, kind of stay tuned for that and be kind of prepping for that. But in the meantime, uh, you know, something that's kind of important to think about is where do we get our information? And so, for example, today, um, if Dr. Deidre Duncan came and shared that, you know, they do not have a long-term care community in the town of Fountain, and, you know, she would like to see something like that get built in Fountain, and what could she do as a city councilwoman to kind of spearhead this and get this rolling? And what role could the Commission on Aging help? And so as we think about that as kind of an example, you know, there's information that we would want to know more, you know, about. And where would we go to get that information? And I'm just going to throw that out there just for a second, just for the commissioners to think about, you know, um, what would we want to know and where would we go to get it? I think what I think through that, I mean, it's a very tangible item, right? There is not a long-term care facility. So that's very tangible, right? We can look it up. We can see there is not one in that area. I think um, the need would have to be assessed. I mean, we've, we've Dayton already really broke all these down, but the need would need to be assessed. So um, how many people in that area would actually need a facility and what does the demographics look like? Would a long-term care facility be sustainable in that area too? And then um, what do long-term care facilities 
that are closest to that area and how are they being utilized. So that's what first comes to my mind is really assessing the need and then what is available for people right now. And then would it be sustainable for a long term facility to actually to come into that location and area? And then determining those factors, um, figuring out where we stand as a commission. And then if we're full for it and supporting it, then we reach out to those long term care facility um, advocates, maybe even JAWS, right? To come up with a game plan of how we can assess that need. So that just came to mind. Thanks. Um, Jared, would you scroll up a little bit more or down a little bit more? There's actually a chart on here. And let's pull that up real quick. Okay, perfect. Um, so again, Mary, as you mentioned, those kinds of things, um, you know, trying to quantify what the need is and some additional demographics, thinking about what does sustainability look like for a long-term care community? Um, you know, what what ones are nearby, you know, a kind of a market analysis, so to speak, or whatever. So the data repository is a chance to say, where would you go to get that information? So when we think about, um, I'm going to start with the easy one, which would be kind of the market analysis, you know, that's kind of easy. You can literally just go and look and see if there's other long-term cares down there. Um, we have the yellow book. It's listed by zip code, so we could figure that out pretty quick. Um, so like data repository, you know, possibly in this case, the yellow book could be a resource. Or if there's other ideas for, you know, figuring out where long-term cares are, you know, where would we be looking that up? The next one um, that's a little harder, of course, is, you know, quantifying the need and the demographics. And so that's where I think this data repository is really good. Like when we're wanting to figure out need or we're wanting to look up specific demographics. So the way Dayton kind of laid this out, um, on the far right, it says sources. So, you know, these are places where you can get information. And uh, I actually had some of their notes written down and I don't think I have them in front of me um, that did not make it on this sheet. Um, cause he actually put this together a while ago, but when we think about wanting to get some more demographics and understand the need, if we look through this list, you know, can we get some good ideas about that from the sources that are listed here, or could we put some other sources into our data repository? So we have, you know, the council of government census data local housing, and this was kind of specifically, he put that in there because he was talking about housing, for example. Well, we're talking about long-term cares, for example. Um, and just kind of wanting to figure out what those generic data sources are, uh, census data, senior advocacy groups, El Paso County Public Health, local senior centers, social service agencies, healthcare providers, um, you know, again, if we were talking about transportation stuff, talking to some transportation authorities. Um, so you can kind of see how, hopefully, you know, you can kind of see how he's was identifying some of these data repositories. But again, what else, where else could we go to get data that would be reliable um, to look at in terms of need and demographics regarding is this uh, specific to this one scenario, uh, no. Fountain, or it's just we want to constantly build out the repository so that we have vetted sources yeah. for gathering information? Yeah, okay. I think, yeah, because what we did want, you know, when we had our strategic planning, we definitely wanted, yeah, AARP, we definitely wanted to make sure that, you know, we weren't just going to, you know, my dad, who's a dentist, and him giving information about oral health, you know, like, so what are the reliable sources of data that we can go to? And as a commission, we're all pretty comfortable with it. Um, you know, and so what might those look like? Uh, for example, there are um, the Bell Policy Center and the Common Sense Institute, kind of state level think tank organizations who do a lot of really good work. Bell Policy Center tends to be a little bit more on the you know, kind of um, progressive or liberal side. Common Sense Institute tends to be a little bit more on the conservative side. So I think it would be really important that we would have both available to be looked at. 
they both provide really good information. And so I wouldn't want to say that we would want to go with one or the other, but we would want to have both available. For example, the Bell Policy Center over the last couple of years did a ton of research around family caregiver needs. And so they were really the go-to for a lot of the state uh, bills that have been presented um, because of the findings that came out of that work around family caregivers. But then, you know, we have another uh, avenue too. And so did Kathy put something up on the screen there? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I said the uh, National MS Society because there's a lot of people with MS in Colorado and uh, Silver Key in El Paso. So I think that it really depends on what the issue at hand is. I might like what Steve's saying, because we can't we could talk about national agencies and and policy makers, right? Out of wazoo. We could fill this up. But I think when it comes down to the issue is really finding that data source that's credible. Um but I also think it's important to get boots on the ground. Uh, like you said, mentioned your dad, the dentist. I do think it's valuable to get that feedback also. So I think it's it's both. Um, and I think it's it's dependent on what topic we're really diving into. I, and is the intent of this, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, is the intent of this for us to create a, uh, basically a position statement that, that says, yeah, like, hey, we agree and back this, or maybe it doesn't justify, or that we can't find the data to back it up? Okay. I would second that with Mary to some extent because we, as the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments and the Commission on Aging, we have such a diversified um, set of populations, right? Park County versus Teller County versus even within El Paso County, there's such a diversified. So I would want to look at, um, I like the census data, but I think we could also look at other advocacy groups around that are part of those areas work with the local governments um and also some of the universities as well as we're seeing with jaws obviously they've done some amazing outreach but it would be also interesting to see kind of what local agencies medical agencies peak vista that type of thing might be seeing with their clientele just to get an idea um, of what's going on locally and talking with the city of Fountain, what are they seeing? What are their challenges? What is Calhan, Payton, Ellicott? What are their challenges for Eastern El Paso County? We know Colorado Springs for the most part because that's the biggest concentration. But then as we go up the pass to Green Mountain Falls, Cascade, um, and Chapita Park, all of that, and into Teller County, what does that look like specifically? Because what's going to work down here may not work up there. So going back to Commissioner uh, to Amy's point of some local control and still understanding that that's going to, we still need those boots on the ground to see what's going to actually be viable in those communities. I, I love the 300 foot view with the census data, social services agency, all of that. But I also think there's also a point of boots on the ground. Who is this truly impacting and, and affecting? And is it viable for them? One other thing I'd recommend if we don't already have it um, would be a some sort of a standardized entry form so that if we have hmm. somebody that requests um, an opinion from the, the organization that um, we have some sort of like standardized level of information so that, you know, we can make we can make a, um, a valid assessment or, you know, ask for additional information to your point to fill in the gaps of uniquenesses within the, the population or the geography or, or, or something else we should consider. I like that idea a lot. Um, just kind of thinking through that. Uh, that's Thank really you. I'd good. like to throw one more item in, if I may. Um, I think a lot of this process would go through when when we have to look at the question or the topic first. Are we looking at housing? What is the issue? And then that issue will drive some of the areas where we go to find the information and get the data. Um, because for Park County, we're so little, you know, I would go to our senior coalition or I would go to our health and human services director to find out specific information about seniors 
within the county. And so I think we have to be a little bit flexible and just have a really long list. And then each question that comes up, we then just filter through the list real quick and identify which ones on the list are gonna be able to serve getting answers to us. I kind of am seeing the possibility of uh, as, as maybe Dayton and I, and if anybody else wants to work on this, uh, you know, ultimately having kind of a one page sheet, but it could be kind of, you know, the very 300 foot view of, you know, places to go to get, you know, very broad generic information, then kind of looking more at a regional approach, where are the places to go um, to get more specific information. Um, and we can plug these various things into maybe those different categories. And that might be a nice way to showcase it on a piece of paper and have some things listed there. Um, and then having some type of a questionnaire that people fill out, you know, like, so Dr. Do Dr. Duncan could have filled something out for us, you know, prior to coming here. And so kind of what would those core questions be that we would want a person to be able to answer? And they might not know the answer, but at least it's going to get them to start thinking about it too, which I think would be good. Yeah, I like the idea of a list as kind of that macro, mezzo, micro, so that we can pull that. And then that's also something that can then also potentially be not just a resource for us, but a resource for all these other agencies that can then kind of come together and make it a more collaborative approach. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And on the questionnaire, um, have the the requester deliver to us the information that they have. And then we can help figure out where we need to to augment their information to really figure out a potential solution or how to help direct them to a solution. So could we go back to, um, I forget the person you said, Melissa, who brought up this issue. Dr. Duncan. And ask, like, kind of do a mock trial sure. of asking her to provide that information and then we can review it. Yep. Okay. For sure. Yep. And so the next thing, so any other final comments on the repository here? Because then we'll continue this conversation a little bit more with the prioritization tool and just, again, trying to feel some things out. And we might be able to generate this kind of interest form here before we leave. <laughs> um, but so any other comments about data and, and how we might look at that? As long as we're all on the same page and it's a living, breathing document, that we don't hold it to it strictly, knowing that different issues are going to bring different research. Mm -hmm. All right. So then, again, back to the prioritization matrix. We did some work with this last month that was really good, that just really highlighted, um, you know, when we're thinking about a topic, we want a lot more information. And... Uh, you know, when we think about, you know, kind of having to have something happen on the spur of the moment, being able to have the person who's coming to us be able to maybe do some of the more, you know, work to figure out some information, but then we're going to have to think among ourselves, can we, you know, trust what this person is presenting? You know, we might actually even on the interest form say, you know, note where you got your numbers, you know, so that might be something that would help. Um so, again, um, when we think about the city of Fountain and, um, you know, a person who is concerned about her own mother and some other people, older adults in the area, and she says, you know, we'd like to, you know, get some strategies and extra backing to, um, you know, look at getting some resources to build a long-term care community. Um when we think about that prioritization matrix. And so Jared, I'll have you go a little bit further so we can actually see the numbers. And so we have the impact, we have duplication, time needed, regional market demand, you know, so as a commission, we would sit and ask, you know, how does the, how does this impact? And I'm trying to think back and I do have the notes in front of me from our minutes. Go ahead, Mary. That that can be the starting point of the questionnaire that the people have to fill out. Oh, good point. So then we can just <laughs> use that to create this tool. Really? Is that easy? <laughs> no. 
why make it more complicated for ourselves if we already have a measuring tool? Let's have them answer the question to the measuring tool and then we can use that data to inform our decision. I like that idea too, because then also, then they can underneath tell us where they got their information, cite their sources, if you will, and then break out a little bit more of like an, uh, of an explanation of how they arrived at their scores. And then that gives us an idea of a starting point, but then we can add to it for ourselves. And it opens the discussion. We know kind of where they're standing and then we can come in as a commission. And so this would just be like an initial vetting tool, right? For the prioritization matrix. And then if it passes this, then there'd be a more detailed dive into the, the need. Yep. Yep. And so Kathy, you want to go ahead and share your comment? I was saying because there's such a large military population, there are a lot of foreign um, spouses or even foreign born military veterans. Great. True. And, you know, and also sign language is often overlooked, the deaf community. Thank you. There's just so many. Yep. So last month when we were uh, looking at kind of the examples that we had last month, one of the questions that came up was, what is the difference between market demand and impact? And what we had said was impact is kind of the ripple effect. Market demand relates to how the clientele is being supported. And so again, when we look at this sheet and you guys you know, have been off doing your own work for the last month, so welcome to today, um, you know, and thinking about the uh, long-term care community and Fountain with impact being the ripple effect versus market demand, are there a lot of folks down there that need it? And so I'm just kind of curious, um, you know, if, if we were to just go around the room and around the Zoom, you know, if we think about spending time working on a long-term care community, Impact, scale of one to five, um, the ripple effect of putting a long-term care facility down there, what do people see? And we don't, you know, if anybody wants to throw out a number, we can literally ask people to, everybody to have to do it. But anyway, does anybody have a... I'll take the leap. This is Danielle. Good. Um, for it, for impact, I think it's probably a three to a four in my mind. Just knowing, um, I saw a family, a elderly family member that lives down there, and when the other individual, that uh, family member that I had living down there, um, needed long term care, we had to move her up into the springs to a facility. There was nothing more local to Fountain. I think there is an aging community down there. I know the senior center is, um, last I knew, and this has been a minute, was, you know, still viable and was still needing support and help. So I think there is potential ripple effect out there. And then also it's a continually growing community, which is only going to keep growing as you know, Colorado is still one of the best destinations, which we need to start hiding that. <laughs> yes, that is a formal request right there. So then let's take a second and think about market demand. Market demand being the concept that, you know, are there a lot of numbers of people down there who need the support? Um. I can only speak for the pool of people I knew that worked on Fort Carson, both sol soldiers and DOD employees that lived in Fountain that were, like me, aging. So they're over 60 and retired and living in Fountain. I think this also goes back to what... Um... I'm sorry for Steve. Thank you. I was going to go for Steve. But I wanted to make sure what Steve was saying. So if the person had brought this to us, we could also then contact um, 
they would have done some of that research for us to Dayton's point. Okay. And to Amy's point now, which of our lists can we go pull from? So then at that point, maybe we do reach out as a commission to the Fountain Senior Center, Fountain City Government, those kind of pieces, kind of bringing it full circle and seeing what are they seeing as far as market to demand? Because I can see the impact being a ripple effect out, but market demand, obviously people are seeing this and this is where, again, bringing that full circle, we could see they could have done, the individual who brought this to us could have done some of the homework for us. Then we as a commission now know who to go reach out to because we're unsure about places. And it kind of just streamlined part of that process for us. So the next one is duplication. And one of the things that we talked about last month was um, you know, do we have any ideas that other people are doing advocacy around this? I don't think we have enough information to jump on that one. But again, I think that goes back to as we're still flushing the system, this process and the system out. Um, to Steve's point, if somebody were to bring this, then they've hopefully have done some of their due diligence. So we kind of know where our baseline is and then we can as a commission jump in from there. Right, and if they did provide us with some information, we could then go to uh, the local government, and I'm not sure of the if Fountain is a municipality, I think they are, um, go to um, either the senior center that you talked about, the local government, and find out what they believe the demand is and who is asking for service that's not, doesn't have service available to them, and try to flesh it out a little bit narrower to find out if there's enough demand um, for the work on the supply side is warranted. Great. So last month when we did this, those were kind of the big, big areas was this impact market demand duplication. Those were kind of the ones that really got people kind of questioning, asking more, um, you know, trying to kind of better understand the nuances between like impact and market demand. And then what does duplication really mean? Um, and then great to know that really we could probably really just use this form to have somebody put some more information down for us before they, before we talk. Um, the, the only thing that's, and again, it might be just a, um, uh, degrees that I'm looking at here, but the the only other question I'd be asking is um, funding. Like, how is this going to be expected to be paid for? Um, and is this private? Is this public? Is that open to all? Uh, because everybody, we can have a great idea, check all these boxes with the five, but if there's no strategy for funding, then that could be the thing that Sinks it. Although, you know, the prioritization matrix might be the first step. And then the second step is like if it passes to talk more funded, about, yeah, you know, and so that could be a, a, a question at kind of the end of the forum is, do you have any thoughts or ideas of where money could come from for this? You know, in the case of a, of a long term care place in Fountain, you know, she's probably thinking, well, it'll be a for profit company that'll just come down and want to build it. But then the other hand is, you know, how do you find that for profit? you know, company that wants to do that, you know, um, but so maybe we could have funding as a kind of a follow along versus it actually becoming a piece of the prioritization tool where, you know, potentially we could say, oh, well, we, you know, it's not going to get funded. So we'd give it a one and then it gets kind of knocked out of the out of the discussion because it's just a one. But we would still maybe want to be discussing things and just kind of but not necessarily have funding be a factor that really weighs i don't know yeah no actually I'd, i the more i think about it the more i'd like the funding to be a separate or recommended separate because if if it really vets out that this is a high impact you know big opportunity to meet an unmet need then you know part of our advocacy can can be to go uh, help find or support that funding uh through some source Okay. Yeah, Steve, I agree. Um, the data that we could gather and put together for um, this topic, if you want to um, talk about this, is here. here's where we fleshed out the, the impact and the demand. Um, and then this could go to source funding or find a provider in another area, maybe somebody operating in Monument 
would like to put a satellite facility down in Fountain. And so it could be a tool to start having conversations with current providers that might want to expand or um, grant opportunities or whatever, nonprofits, you know, it, it could be a tool for them. Cool. All right, any other comments? This is Paula. I'm glad Steve brought that up. That was my first thought is who's going to do it. And then my big thought next is who's going to staff it. Um, so there's staffing shortages all over the state, all over the country for people to work in long term care facilities. They're 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 just short staffed um, and that's not I mean, you can build a beautiful place and and, you know, wine and dine the customer. But if you don't have the staff to run it, it 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 fails. So that would be a concern of mine is where. Where will you get the people to staff it well? That's a great point, Paula. This is Danielle again. Um, but I like the idea, back to Amy's point, as this is then a tool, and to Steve's point for advocacy, this is then a tool that then we as a commission could take to various air, you know, at, as an advocacy and kind of push it up the chain, kind of like we were originally talking about early on with this commission. Um, of saying this is something that is a market demand. It would make an impact. It's not a duplication of work, the time needed, you know, those pieces. But now, you know, maybe this is something that the county needs to look at. Maybe the city of Fountain needs to look at. Some of the work has already been done and maybe it's just an advocacy to those pieces. And yeah, there's a, there's a shortage everywhere. And I don't think that's something that we can solve, but then that definitely lends to the bigger piece to then take it more macro and say, okay, so maybe JAWS does need to run with this more. Maybe, you know, there's just so many ways that this could go, but I think this just gives us a great opportunity to kind of bring concerns from the local communities up and then help filter it. I think this just would add value um, to that advocacy piece that we were looking at as commissioners. Well, and I think too, we could, this is Paula again, to, 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 to maybe invent something different and, you know, not just your basic long-term care facility, but to have a facility that maybe could be intergenerational with long-term care and, and youth programming, or could be a day program that could be the stepping stone into a permanent stay facility. I mean, you, we could think outside the box then and do something different for their need. They might need a day program to start and then have have a place where they those folks need permanent care and so stepping stones type things. But I've seen intergenerational long-term care facilities with with daycare attached. I've seen um, you know, day program is is vital. I'm I'm in the process of of starting one in Colorado Springs, but the whole purpose of an adult day program is to keep people from a premature nursing home placement. And if to do that, it gives their person a day out. It gives the caregiver a break, so they can recharge to be a better caregiver. And it doesn't have to be I can't do this anymore. I'm going to place you because I can't do this anymore. It's like you get a break, I get a break, we're going to do this for as long as we can. And I've done it, I've seen it happen that people have been able to keep their loved ones home for years longer because of a day setting versus just getting to the end of their rope saying, I can't do this, I'm going to, I'm going to place you because I can't do this. There's, there's lots of different options and models that can pay, maybe work for this community versus just planning another long-term care facility in their community. Paula, that's, I like that idea because you're really thinking outside the box. As I think just big picture, 
I don't think as a commission we have to have all the answers. We don't have to come up with all the solutions of funding and, you know, we don't have to get in the nitty gritties. I think if we really dive down and we see this as an issue and we use the this tool to assess that, then we can pass it along and, and we can elevate it where there's more conversations that it's not us figuring out how to solve the problem. And so I don't think that should stop us where we have to get in the nitty gritties because um, – that's I don't think that's for us. I don't think that's for us to get in the degrees. What I do like about it, though, is that um, by Paula asking those questions, I bet Dr. Duncan never even thought about it, you know. So the cool thing about the commission is the commissioners here from experience can kind of ask some additional questions for that person who's going to be kind of doing a little bit, a lot more of the work. But then, as you said, the commission can also be elevating it to other levels to raise awareness and have the conversation happen, um, you know, at a, at a, at a regional level, you know, for El Paso County, for, you know, whatever level it can, can, can continue to. So very, very good. Other comments about the data repository, the prioritization piece, I'll, I'll take these back to the executive committee and um, craft up some new uh, kind of forms and, and ways things look. Um, but other thoughts, closing thoughts? Peyton on should this? be proud of us. He's yeah. not here, but he should be proud of us. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to make one other comment. I think one of our uh, if people come to us with a need and a question and asking for for advice and direction, you know, we can help help bring all this to them and then help lead them where they need to go. Um, because a lot of times people just don't know how to get started and don't know how to flesh out the issue and figure out where to go to try to solve their problem. So I think we could really uh, do a lot of good work and help empower um, the entities who who want to move something forward and just kind of get behind them as a um, as an assistant. All right. So kind of that being said, uh, another issue that has been brought to my attention that I have not brought to the commission yet, uh, there's a group of people over on the southeast side, well, not southeast, pretty much just east side of Colorado Springs who want to start um, another senior center. So who knows, maybe they'll be coming to the table. I'll have them fill out this sheet <laughs> and we'll go from there. So, um, and then today, uh, earlier today, we had um, a quarterly provider meeting with the, or with the entities that the AAA funds, and we had a pretty in-depth conversation about nutrition services and trying to figure out uh, what might need to happen across the region to better address the um, the lack of food going out to folks. And um, so Kathy Lowry from Teller County brought up that they have created up in the Teller County area um, a hunger coalition that, and I think it's just for seniors. Well, I can't say that for sure. My notes are in the office now. Um, but I thought that was really, you know, kind of a neat idea. Um, and so like in Teller County, you know, they've kind of elevated the fact that, you know, getting people good nutritious food is a real priority and a real need. Um, and so just kind of passing that on to the commission here to realize they've kind of gotten organized around some efforts up there in Teller County. So that's kind of neat to hear and see how they're doing that. Is that Teller County specific? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And yeah, so, just, uh, I was just going to comment that Park County, because we're such a large county, uh, we have regional food banks um, in Bailey, Fair Play, um, Hartzell, um, uh, Lake George, not so much. We probably piggyback on Teller more and uh, Guffey to try to help with those immediate needs and and be closer to those in need. So you know, we have to re we have to create what works in that region, but uh, good on Teller because with the cost of food going up so much, we are seeing at the county level, it is starting to become a real issue. So I will turn it back over to you, um, Amy, to continue down the agenda here for our last few minutes here. 
All right. Well, thank you, Melissa. We've got uh, discussion items. So anything anyone wants to bring up for the good of the commission or um, what we might need to talk about? Um, I guess it's kind of an announcement. Is that this? Is this the right time? Nope. You can wait one more second I'm for gonna announcement. I'm going to wait for that then. <laughs> It looks like we have no discussion items. So next up is member announcements. I got an announcement. Um, <laughs> so Saturday, April 29th, there is a senior expo at the Wildham Park Community Church put by the Golden Bridge Network. I believe it's from 9 to 2. And um, there'll be a variety of different vendors and speakers from talking about emergency preparedness, um, all different such. But um, anyone's welcome to attend and uh, there'll be lunch too, free lunch. Will you be there? I will. And I'm Would... going to be in the kitchen passing oh. the food. So, so I, AAA is going to be there, um, and I have a one-page sheet that when I go to events like that, um, I'm handing out this one-page sheet that talks about the Commission on Aging and the Regional Advisory Council. If people want to, you know, like you never know who you're talking to there, and then you can kind of just say, hey, you seem like you're really interested in your in your community. Did you know that we have this group, and would you be interested? So I will um, make sure that the people who are at that event um, on April 29th have that one pager. But if anybody else is going and would want that to, um, you know, have in their folder to hand to anybody, let me know. All right, thank you. Any other announcements or anything we need to know about what's coming up uh, within the next month? Kathy might have, oh, Kathy might want, Kathy, you're saying, go ahead, Kathy. I'm sorry, I'm never really sure when to speak and when to be quiet. <laughs> I'm saying uh, I might want to go. I'm not that familiar with Woodland Park but it might be a good opportunity to gather more information and I might want that sheet to use. Great. In well, let me other let, areas too. Yeah. Well, I'll print some out for you and we can make arrangements to get them to you. Great. Thank you. I'll, and then I'll just mention somewhat in closing, um, May is older Americans month. How many people were tracking that? <laughs> that's right um and so since we won't see each other um until the middle of may i wanted to just mention that um, our board of directors did sign a proclamation for older americans month and that proclamation i'm just going to read a few things to you guys as you uh you know head out into the end of april and then may comes around uh so the the uh, Shoot. The theme for Older Americans Month for this year was not right here, even though I'm looking right at it. Um, but basically it talks about recognizing the need to create a community that offers the services and support older adults may need to make choices about how they age and can build an even better community for our residents by not limiting our thinking about aging, exploring and combating stereotypes, emphasizing the many positive aspects of aging, inspiring older adults to push past traditional boundaries, and embracing our community's diversity. And so there is a little catchphrase Aging Unbound, here it is. It's written in green on my notes here. So May, Aging Unbound. And so as you guys head out um, and May 1st rolls around, just kind of be thinking about um, how are we, you know, supporting those around us to be more unbound in their aging. So anyway. Melissa, uh, that yeah. is that is really awesome words. And would you mind sharing that with me? Because um, the Board of County Commissioners might be interested in our own proclamation. 
I will send it to you. Great. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. I wanted to give an update about where innovations and aging is. I think Diane last month talked about um, the age-friendly 2.0 models. So really looking at expanding the age-friendly livable communities scope into the county. And so the work groups have completed their um, strategy plans and a write-up of what those plans will include and goals for the next five years will be coming out June 1st. So we can look to see what those plans are. And I think it would be beneficial for us as a commission to review those because a lot of those strategies were pulled from listening sessions um, and what had been done in the past five years for the age, the age from the 1.0 model too. So I think that can help us become more aware of what's happening um, in a county, well, El Paso County perspective too. So more to come on that. And congratulations on that. That's really cool. Very, very cool. And I know Innovations is actually presenting to the El Paso County Commissioners on the 24th next week. That is weird. Okay. Okay. Oh, and, you know, Manitou's in the county. It's in Manitou. <laughs> and they're doing a job. It's open to the public. So anyone's welcome to come. Um, Erin is the new executive director for innovations. And she will be presenting. I don't know, Steve, but she may be presenting <laughs> some early facts about what um, the write-up will be. So, so that's 24th? Yes, the 24th. And I believe I can pull up the details, but I think it's at 830. Uh, AM. Their meetings are typically at nine. Oh, thank you. Now I don't know if they change it for this one, but they typically start at nine. You know, I'm all over the place. It's not the 24th. It's the 25th. It's Tuesday. Okay. And it's at Manitou Springs City Hall. And it is at nine. Thanks, Sharon. Oh. <laughs> follow follow the parking rules <laughs> <laughs> yes um all right any other any other announcements or uh items that we should know about all right um as melissa said our next meeting is may 17th so it will be here before we know it um and our executive committee, we will we meet the first Wednesday of each month at 1030 by Zoom. Um, anything about uh, policy committee meetings? No, and um, it'll be interesting because possibly Jared will have a or or Jody will have a kind of summary of what's happened because the legislature will have concluded by the time we meet again. And uh, that will be a really good thing because uh, <laughs> our life kind of gets crazy for four months. Um, and uh, PPACG meetings, um, board meeting is uh, what, the second Wednesday? Yep. Went off memory, okay. I guess last call for items. Um, Anything we want to add on the agenda for next month that is a request by anyone present? I take that as a no. All right. I guess I will take the this opportunity to um, adjourn if you are also inclined. Sounds good here. All right. Have a great month. Great to see you all. Sorry I did not have time to make the drive down to the springs, but you all take care.